Uh, this topic is uh, how to detect phishing URLs using PySpark by Hitesh. Uh, he is an independent security researcher. His interest lies in networking security, data science, and big data. So over to you, Hitesh. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for showing up. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, uh, I mainly do internet threats, uh, work on around security, malcode, privacy, and uh, malware engineering kind of efforts. Um, this work has been, uh, if, you, if you want access to these slides, you can actually go to the web page now and download them yourself in case you can't see them at the back. Um, so what is this talk about? Uh, essentially, this talk is about my attempt to solve a problem. Um, I wouldn't yet say that this was a successful attempt because it's still ongoing. Um, but basically, the problem is about detecting phishing URLs and what has been done until now to detect these uh, malicious entities on the web and how to protect common people against them. Uh, why I made the choices that I made to use PySpark and MLlib and uh, various other things. Uh, I am by no means a machine learning expert, so uh, you will have to take what I say about machine learning with a grain of salt. And this is not a talk about finding, you know, a success story to find a solution or anything per se. So uh, what in the world is phishing, right? Uh, typically, I, I find that to be any form of credential theft, uh, any form of uh, theft where uh, intellectual property or personal details like usernames and passwords and credit card numbers are being taken from you when you thought you were giving that data out to a legitimate person and you were in fact not. And why to solve this problem? And this basically stems from a very local uh, issue, right? In my city where I am from, um, the police department gets about 50 complaints a day regarding phishing. Now, whether that is in the form of malicious emails or whether that is in the form of social engineering and someone calling you and telling you that I'm calling from a bank and taking your uh, credit card number, all that ties into the phishing problem. And this is, this is a problem that has not been solved as correctly as many of the other problems. Like for example, for, anti, for viruses and malware, you have antiviruses. For uh, APT style threats, you have a lot of products in the world out there that you can go and buy. But there is not much for, for a phishing scam uh, stopping, to a common man at least. And th there is also this sort of moral side to it, right? That phishing takes more advantage of the gullible rather than the tech savvy. Because I can pretty much assume that nobody here is going to get affected by phishing because you guys know what you're doing. But on the other hand, there is a majority of the populace that does not, uh, and to whom these problems have yet to be solved. Um, where it gets even more difficult is that is those two news articles that came out uh, relatively close to each other where the Director General of Police of Karnataka actually lost money because he fell victim to a phishing scam. Um, so what, what do we do in today's world to beat these sorts of malicious entities, right? Uh, we have these ever prevalent blacklists. So uh, you can go and download a list of URLs uh, every single hour that will tell you that you know these URLs are now malicious or these URLs are hosting content that are that, that is not that is detrimental to people uh, in a broad sense and then there are other people who write sort of uh, uh, yara rules if you're ever familiar with them uh, on email bodies and say okay you, if you if these words appear in an email then i can assume that this is phishing email or something of that sort. But there's no uh, sort of solution where people are still happy with it. Uh, Google actually did a pretty good job at the safe browsing initiative, but the problem is that that is only applicable if you're using Chrome or if you're using some browser bundles that have been tied with Google that can offer you that sort of protection. So for example, if I get um, uh, some link to me on my corporate account and I have to click on it, uh, there is no filter, there is no safe browsing that I can leverage at that point to, to really make a difference. Um, also, uh, people say that, okay, let's, you know, let's be strict about it and, and I, we will download this list of uh, beautiful Alexa 5 million top domains and we will only allow things to be clicked uh, only on those 5 million domains and if anyone wants to go to any other website, then we will sort of, you know, show a small warning before we make things go ahead. But those are sort of only making it a tiny bit harder to, to get owned, but not stopping the problem at all. DMARC does a, a very great job, but uh, you can stop spam to a great degree, but not phishing URLs, because typically uh, if, it, if, when, if, you were, uh, if you know about this during the, uh, what to call it correctly, job hiring spree that happens every time graduates come out of school, you'll notice that 
uh, people create identities like my company job interviews 2015 at gmail.com and you can't put you can't block gmail.com from sending you email right at that point so there is nothing you can do until unless you actually look at the content that is being clicked at that point and then decide for yourself whether this is good or bad um, so like any other approach i had to start with ground zero my ground zero is existing research on detecting phishing urls uh, which led me into the machine learning direction for some time because I had fondled with these things but I'm again by no means an expert at machine learning uh, per se and uh, the most amount of success I had with you know find getting features from these data sets of phishing URLs and and emails and and sort of running them through various classifiers was this concept about decision trees and it intuitively makes sense to anyone who is in the security industry because we as a clan tend to think of maliciousness and benign activity in terms of rules. So we say, okay, if this happened, this happened, this happened, and this happened, then it is bad, or it does not meet my level of comfort. And if this, this, this happens, then I am relatively okay with someone doing anything with it. Um, also, it was pretty expressive in, ex in, in sort of saying what I wanted uh, to come out of such a model was, hey, if we find a URL and the content of the web page has such and such and such entity, then we don't want, we don't like this. So uh, testing it out and humanly looking at it became very, very simple and easy to do. Um, which brings to my second choice about PySpark and MLlib. Uh, I tend to be a little biased towards Spark for my own reasons, but uh, it allows me to sort of comb in a lot more web pages than I normally can. Um, there is a very good resource for getting phishing, phishing URLs called Fish Tank, and you can get brand new URLs about phishing from there uh, every hour, and you just run a crawler that fetches the HTML for you uh, time and again. Uh, this led me to have a pretty good data set at this point. Um, on a parallel note, ML use, MLlib uses something called scikit-learn that you all know about, which made it very easier to even find documentation and, and sort of cross-reference and see whether I am on the right track. Um, so for this tiny experiment of mine, I gathered about 12 gigabytes of web pages, which doesn't seem like a lot, but then I realized that it's a pain point to parse HTML and, and extract features out of it for every single web page. And if you have uh, two and a half lakh web pages and about t five, 10,000 being added to them every day, you realize why you now need to do something with, with a cluster computing engine like Spark and not just write a for loop and, and go to bed. Um, so, uh, which again brings me to the point that uh, I also did not want to roll out my own multi-processing framework where I say, okay, you consume, this process consumes these many, this se section of these web pages, and this other process consumes this section, and we sort of bring features together at the end. Uh, not something I want to reinvent the wheel uh, kind of approach. Also, you can save a model in Spark and load it anywhere else, so that makes it easier for deployment now. Uh, I don't know why they had to wait until 1.4 to do that, but whatever. Um, so what are the features that sort of worked, right? Uh, typically, if you get go to see, uh, people use dynamic DNS domains uh, mostly for malicious activity. If you see any traffic going to a dynamic DNS domain, uh, which you have explicitly not gone to, then I can about assure you that it is not something good. It is definitely some bot trying to, trying to contact. Uh, you never also tend to go to a direct IP address in external situations because you would typically go to Google or a search engine of your choice and type in some search uh, query and go to a link. So you're never actually interacting with IP addresses directly. Uh, so these are the things that I thought was, were, would be indicators of phishing URLs happening, right? Because these URLs, these web pages for phishing are very, very short lived until the point that the hosting provider realizes that, hey, this content is causing more harm than anything else. And at this point I have to take it down. And, but the crux of everything comes in the dynamic part, right? Because the moment, uh, the, the only way humans detect phishing pages is, by, is that we look at the web page, we look at the URL, and we say, you know what, this Yahoo logo stopped shipping in 2002. How can they still have a web page with that logo on? Or, or any such thing, you may see that uh, the web page doesn't load properly, you may see certain errors. Uh, these are the th mistakes that, that phishing attackers make. And these are okay for me and you to understand, but it's very difficult to convince uh, an algorithm to say, uh, look at a logo and say, tell me what logo it is, unless, until you go to, into a, a separate science of its own uh, to, to figure out whether a particular place is genuine or not. Uh, 
a little counterpoint to this is the fact about SSL and CPU pinning, but most people don't pay attention whether they are on a pinned HTTPS site when they go to google.com. If they see Google's logo and it says enter your email address, they will happily type it out. Um, but the, the sort of bullet approach, uh, approach came to this when it said, if you see a form and you say uh, email address password, the moment you know that, that the post request of that form is actually not going to google.com or, or any search service, then you definitely know this is not uh, this is not something that is good for anyone, for that matter of fact. Uh, and we leverage those kinds of features in, in, in MLlib, and, and all we do is take about 10 or 12 features, uh, put them in sort of a true or false sort of vector, I think that you call it a one-hot vector, and you accept, uh, you let the model train, it gives you a very beautiful tree, and it says if this, then malicious, if not, then, for, then benign, and so on and so forth. Um, for someone who doesn't know a lot about decision trees, it sort of also um, tells me what is the most useless feature, right? Because if I say that having a form with a password is a useful feature to detecting a phishing page, and that feature is present in benign pages and phishing pages with equal amounts of probability, then that feature is useless because it's not giving me an ability to distinguish between any one of those two, two sets at any given point in time, in which case I might as well throw it out. Um, so it does this time and again, time and again, until it finds out that, okay, these, these features in this way gives me sort of the best uh, fit, so to speak. Um, and whatever does not add value is thrown away. And what we get sort of is, is something that sort of surprised me at the beginning because once the model got trained and I ran it on, on, on a piece of um, um, test data, it classified about 99% classified about of those web pages correctly, which seemed to do good to be true if that is what you're thinking, which is correct because in the real world, we actually have a lot more phishing pages uh, than we have real pages because if you want to find out whether a Gmail login page is real or not, you will only get one example of it from google.com. But if you go to find phishing pages for the same thing, you will find hundreds of them. So there is this problem where you have the data set for benign pages is far lesser than the data set for malicious pages. And you cannot actually get more benign pages because there is only so many services there are in the world that you have to defend against. But it gave a lot more, appro uh, there were a lot of false positives, about 35, 37% of false positives when you used, when you gave it benign URLs and it came back misclassified as, as malicious, uh, which got quickly offset with some whitelisting, right? So uh, typically, uh, barring some edge cases, you will be okay if you are going to google.com or let's say you're going to docs.google.com, you are relatively safer. There are cases where things might go wrong, but relatively safer. So offsetting these kinds of things by, by a whitelist, by, by some mechanism of trusted sites can give you far um, better results. Uh, and if you incorporate something like safe browsing, hopefully we get to do that if Google releases it as open source, um, we can do much, much, much better. So we quickly realized that uh, having Alexa as a part of the feature, meaning uh, if this URL is in the Alexa list, um, if, if that's a feature, that does not help at all because uh, dynedns.org actually appears in the Alexa list, in which case all the dynamic DNS domains go out of the window right there. Also, you might say that, hey, you know what, this, these phishing URLs come up on very, very new domains, right? Like someone might register a domain last week and then use it to do something malicious this week. Uh, so you can, you know, say, rep give a reputation score to the, to the domain name and then you can decide whether this is a good or a bad domain, which again does not work because uh, people register and do keep domain names for a long time or use dynamic DNS services or typically these attackers might have moved from more malware-like activity to phishing-like activity now, and you cannot really judge just by the reputation of the domain about what is really going on. Um, and there is, there, there is still a tiny problem to this, right? Because every time now you need to classify web pages, you need to actually get the HTML for that page and then figure out what features it has and then send it to a model and send it back which is a good and a bad thing because uh, if you have a browser extension that can compute these features and send them up to some service, uh, the lookup takes like less than a microsecond to do, right? Because once you have the model and it's listening on some port, 
it's very quick to make that decision. So the idea is sort of to extend um, this approach where the features are computed locally to whoever has an extension to stop phishing and then th that, that sort of only the feature vector comes to us and we can just reply with, hey, don't click on this or click on this and, and it, would be a, it would be beneficial to a lot of common people in the world um, to be protect, uh, protected against phishing attacks. Um, there are a couple of other problems also that, that arise out of this approach is because once you put this out uh, in the wild, and this is to, to with any problem in security, uh, attackers will find other ways to sort of subvert your, your feature gathering capability, right? Say, if you're looking for a password uh, field, instead of putting a form, they might actually put two text inputs and do some crazy things where you sort of, they sort of try to evade your uh, feature scanning approach. Um, which again brings you back to square one because um, as they rightfully say, the defender has to be right 100% of the time and the attacker needs to get lucky just once. So uh, that is going to be an active problem. Also getting new pages every now and again requires that you ha now have dedicated infrastructure to, to fetch these web pages, to crawl these web pages time and again and to update your model every single time. Uh, it's still not as bulletproof as a human looking at it but it is better than most approaches that are out there. Um, also, one of the problems is that Spark does not have an API face, so you can't just take a model and say, accept any input that comes on port 80 and then just tunnel it to, to this model and then write the response to a database or something. You still can't do that, so you have to find like hacks around writing tiny pipes between things and say, okay, you communicate with this guy, you communicate with this guy, and it gets messy really, really fast. Um, but again, uh, we will find problems to such things time and again as they happen. Um, that's sort of uh, like a rough sketch about, uh, about phishing URLs and this technique doesn't necessarily apply just to URLs but also to uh, emails, right? Because the same way you uh, extract features out of HTML, you can extract features out of uh, email communications as well, whether that be an exchange email or, or whatever that is. Um, that's basically sort of the approach that uh, that we've had until now. Uh, this is what we got. It's sort of a mix between static features and dynamic features. Uh, when I say static features, I mean features that just rely on the URL, right? Just the text of the URL, nothing to do with the content of the web page. And then there are some features that rely on the URL, on the HTML of the page, which means, okay, we're actually looking at the content of the page and deciding for ourselves whether this is a, a legitimate page or not. Um, so this is where we are now. Uh, that's all I actually have to share. If you have any approaches that you've tried and tested or if you would like to contribute to this, you are welcome to take the data set or take the code. Um, once this meets sort of some measure of quality, uh, it will be open source since the point is to have it accessible and usable by everyone in the world uh, who is, you know, sort of uh, can fall a victim to phishing at this point. Um, and I can, I can take any questions you have that, that are based on security or, or phishing. Any questions? Yeah. So as you said, like, so most of the things uh, is like, so you need to pass the content of the page and then decide most of the things, right? So have you tried the approach of putting up a, like uh, playing out with some plugins with reverse proxies or some of the other stuff? Because that helps, right? So that helps identify, so uh, as a reverse proxy, you are uh, ha like having all the requests which are going through and the response which is coming back. And it it's very easy, like a honeypot or something, to identify the patterns which is which you want to, uh, which you want to learn and then block or dis uh, do some other stuff. Uh, so like, so there are certain things which we have done in past, so I will be happy to uh, like interact uh, post your talk to okay. explain which tools we have uh, used, uh, which we use in email and other stuff, okay. which can be used to ma mark a ham or spam kind of stuff um, in phishing also, okay. using so, reverse proxy stuff. Yeah, so uh, there's two things, right? Uh, the reverse proxy is useful only when you know where the traffic is going to pass from. Uh, for example, if I am here at PyCon, I know that all my uh, web requests are going to be routed through some server, right? And I can put some defensive measures there. Um, the also second alternative is to do this inside like a browser extension or something like that because browser extensions are, are really lightweight. They can run per computer regardless of where that computer is. Um, they anyways have, have access to the HTML page which means you don't have to sort of re-examine the page in transit or something like that. 
and again, extracting features will be simpler per computer on the browser rather than uh, like at a at a gateway or something of that sort. No, so agree. we've tried those two approaches and, and yeah. So only the learning part, uh, I'm saying like so. Uh, like a honeypot, you put a reverse proxy, try to learn those things and put those features in your browser extension or somewhere else. True, true. And yeah. uh, that will be, a, uh, I agree, that, that's definitely uh, something that is yeah. being done. Yeah. Uh, what are the features uh, that you used to, uh, to, uh, to classify a site, uh, such as, uh, is it uh, mostly about uh, textual uh, content or, uh, or features of the DNS or which, which all features? So um, there are, all the features are, are binary except for one. Um, the features are, we see whether the domain name that you get in the URL is the same domain where the post request is going to, right? So that's one feature. Another feature is to check if, uh, uh, normally you see, so for example, if you're fishing for eBay credentials, right? You will traditionally see that the URL will look something like signin.ebay.com.hello.xyz dot some bad domain dot ru, right? And and in that case, you know that the top level domain is actually not ebay.com and it's just, you know, sort of fuzzing itself to look like uh, ebay.com. And we try to find these brands in the email and say, okay, if we find a legitimate brand in the URL, then true, that, so that's, that's another feature. Um, I'd be glad to share this with you because I have 15 and I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. So uh, there are a bunch of these and we can talk about all the features offline. Uh, hi. So, uh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, to your right. Yeah. Yeah, just to. Sorry, I have very uh, bad eyesight. Hi. Oh, okay. Yeah, hi. So, um, I'm sorry, but this is a machine learning question. Oops. Uh, <laughs> just out of curiosity, which other techniques uh, than uh, decision trees have you tried out and uh, what made you zero in on decision trees? I have tried everything that comes in the MLlib package. Uh, everything from uh, log the logistic regression to. Uh, the SVM classifiers, all of them. I found that decision trees are good. I have just discovered that even random forests are giving somewhat similar performance, but I haven't tried, had uh, like a chance to deep dive into random forests and check out what they do. So um, uh, Spark actually accepts, does not have, uh, uh, you don't have to change things much between changing classifiers. So you, I could basically run all of them and just check at the end, what's the best sort of detection rate that I can get. And decision trees turned out to be that one. Right, and, and uh, classification accuracy is the only metric uh, that you were looking for when deciding between? Uh... Um, yes, I mean, th that's sort of what we're aiming, I am aiming for as a, as a detection uh, efficacy point of view, right? Because my problem is to classify something as malicious when it is malicious. So to me, at least classification is, is sort of the primary motto. Uh, I realized that there's gonna be a sort of F an FP rate and there's gonna be another uh, true FP rate but, but in this case, it doesn't really hurt anyone. So. Yeah, not to, not to me. Okay, cool. yeah. uh, I, I, I am not doing that right now, and I have found why I am not doing that. It's because uh, typically if you go to, um, say you go to login.gmail.com, right? That page actually does not show up consistently from time to time. Uh, it may be something today, it might be something else tomorrow. Not the, not the, like the viewing experience. I'm talking about the underlying uh, JavaScript and HTML that comes with it. Uh, also, this begs to the point that then I can only protect people against web pages that I've previously seen benign versions of before. So for example, if I have the page for ICICI.com's web login interface and I don't have it for IDBI bank, then and if I get a phishing page for IDBI bank, I have no metric to compare that against. So that sort of seemed like a bottleneck that would not be uh, a scalable solution at that point. But I'm happy to be proven wrong uh, on this. I have one question. Like uh, Apache Spark uh, uses Scala, Python, and Java. And R. And R. Okay. So which were, uh, which language you are using, and which is the most fa fascinating for you? Uh, obviously, so uh, Spark cheats a little bit because when you use PySpark, you're actually not. It's not implementing everything natively in Python. So they have a gateway of sorts where it's sort of slipping. You know, sort of giving a check to someone through a through a channel underneath the door and it just, just sort of uh, ships tasks underneath and everything actually runs on the JVM rather than running on the Python interpreter. But yes, by, by far the experience to use Python is, is far better than using, I mean, I, am, I don't know R for even the first line. So yeah, the experience to use uh, Spark as a cluster computing framework and as a means of sort of processing large data sets very, very quickly is, is very, very, very easy to do in Python than anything else. 
Thanks, Tish. Thank you.